point on the journey of life, I found myself in a dark forest, for the clear path was lost. The game starts on the, the surface, which is how the poem starts. You know, you're sort of leaping into, into hell. When you jump through that door to follow the devil and your fiance's soul down into the depths of hell, that's the moment where our Alice jumps through the rabbit hole. Whoa, this is unlike anything on Earth, right? It's hell. Divine Comedy was written in the early part of the 1300s um, by a guy named Dante Alighieri. He spends his life uh, dreaming about a woman that he loved named Beatrice who he never got to be with. He writes this poem, which is basically about his journey through the afterlife to get to her. So the number one thing that Dante Alighieri is remembered for is creating that typical view of hell, uh, the medieval vision that has lasted throughout the ages. Dante essentially introduces the concept of the nine circles of hell. I mean, it lays it out level by level, you know, the punishments of hell and where each sinner goes in hell in these different circles. He's literally like laying out a map of hell. That poem itself was disturbing and it describes the different rings of hell and all this anguish and suffering. And I think that's also one of the most appealing aspects of it. I read the poem and thought right away, like, that's a video game. We can make a video game out of that. Go to hell, that's our game. Simple and this is the point. Face the ultimate boss, which is Lucifer himself. Once you hear the pitch about what the fiction's going to be, it just instantly makes sense. One of the most important things for us was to literally follow the map of hell that Dante wrote so clearly in the poem. We're not gonna create a circle called jealousy or shoplifting, yeah? We're gonna go with the circles that are actually in the poem. So the things in the inferno that we knew we couldn't change, I mean definitely the rings of hell, and also like the major characters. Of course each piece we sort of interpret a little bit differently. The character that you play in the game is a reimagination of the original Dante, and he's fighting for love. The Lucifer has taken his love, Beatrice, into hell, and he actually fights death, and he actually defeats death, and takes death's sight, and he says, you know, I'm gonna take this thing, I'm gonna go into hell, I'm gonna get her. facing some of the most insane monsters that Hill has to throw at him. He's got to be kind of an over-the-top action hero. Everything you do in this game is brutal. It involves eviscerating, ripping open. It's definitely a brutal game. It's not for the faint of heart. We have enemies that push the limits of taste. And kind of be like, oh, oh, dude, you see that? I want that. I want that moment, and we're working our butts off to deliver that. The first thing you hear when you when you come into limbo for the first time is screaming. Right away, he sees like shades falling, screaming, you know, ah, as they fall in, they're screaming. And you know, from moment one, you know you're in hell. People are being vomited into hell. Masses of people huddled together, naked and scared, cold and huddled. Oh, the humanity! And then Big Minos is gonna judge you at the end. It's bad. I mean, it only gets worse from there. You know, it's all downhill from there. It's gonna get much, much crazier as you as you descend. It's just gonna get really dark very quickly once you pass Minos. This is hell proper. Here we go. Dante's Inferno is dark. It has a dark beauty to it, but it's always disturbing. Like, I recognize a human person there, but their sins have kind of twisted who they are or turned them into an abomination. It doesn't just contain tormented souls, but it's actually made up of tormented souls. Everything about Dante's Inferno is about torment. In Lust, the tormented souls are uh, their lovers searching for each other. They're denied each other and that's their punishment. Reaching out to each other but never able to touch. They're downed, right? So you get a sense of sort of the solitude, uh, suffering. It's kind of out in this ocean of, of loneliness surrounded by this weather storm of people. It's kind of like if you picture a hurricane combined with a tornado with bodies just writhing and swirling in it. Inside you can just see this orgy of bodies in there. There's this whole sexual overtone but it's, it's really disturbing and, and repulsive. 
at the same time that it's kind of compelling. I want the environments to reflect, you know, those sins, the sins of the flesh, and, um, and also to reflect kind of a personal hell. As sort of seductive as, you know, all those images that you have when you say the word lust, it's actually pretty violent. <laughs> We did have some excellent people from the out outside the company, some brilliant artists, work with us to give us a little influence. Wayne especially, he's been working with the Inferno theme for a very long time. Nobody draws and knows hell like Wayne Barlow. If you're familiar with the Guillermo del Toro movies, he's got a great sort of creature concept. People have seen it in Hellboy and seen it in Harry Potter. He's been drawing hell for you know over a decade. He's got his own series of paintings that are called Barlow's Inferno, and uh, his images are just stunning and uh, imaginative and twisted and weird. Cleopatra is kind of the monster boss character of Lust. We had some early concepts that were just, like, so weird. Sex organs all over her body and her fingers and her face, and Wayne Barlow was, took a crack at her and he took that quite literally, and uh, that was like a really creative and fun exercise, but ultimately not a character that I think you know, would have served the game. <laughs> Disturbing is the watchword. Um, brutal is the watchword. The world is being beautifully rendered, but is always disturbing. You know, it sounds easy, like, oh, cool, we'll do a level based on, you know, around violence, you know, we'll do a level based around lust, like, that'll be easy. But then you sit down to do it and you really, struggle to, to push the boundaries. You can be totally gratuitous and really kind of like silly about it and really pornographic about it. You know, let's just hang a huge penis out there and you know, call it a day. You can also make it um, kind of interesting, thoughtful and provocative. I probably have 200 pictures of intestines on my machine. Uh, pictures of defecation, bodies cut in half. It's, again, it's supposed to be a very disturbing game and our source material and reference material is equally as disturbing. There have been some emails sent out that... Gluttony for us is obviously about um, digestion. Gluttony is just it's disgusting. It's like walking through somebody's intestines. You're not walking on the ground, you're walking on stomach. You're not walking on mud, you're walking through feces. Kind of soft, but gross, squishy and fat. Bile infested, disgusting kind of areas. And these worms snapping and biting. You're almost like in the bowels of a beast. It's a beautiful place to be. It's pretty gross. Hell is really almost the the biggest character in our game. Hell is the star of the show, there's no question. Of course, as you're progressing through the circles, the gameplay becomes more challenging. There's this sense of intensity, both in terms of what, what your enemies are doing, and also what the environment is doing to you. I knew to pull off a project this ambitious, we'd have to have an incredible level design team. So I was able to convince uh, Michael Chang, who's just one of the best in the business, Metroid Prime, God of War. Convincing him to join the team and basically lead the level design effort was almost emotional turning point for the project. There's this area called the Hall of Gluttons, and it's kind of like a mind trip thing where Lucifer is controlling your environment the way we try to stage the puzzle. That makes it feel like the environment is like alive. That's probably the best kept secret about the game. You're gonna be treated to just unbelievable variety in the level design throughout the entire game. The notion of hell, kind of the underworld and the afterlife, has you know totally captivated people for centuries. It taps into our deepest fears. Everyone is afraid of death. People want to know, well, what's it like? Inferno is interpreted by a lot of different artists and we basically wanted to take pieces from all of that. Some of the great painters um, of like the real medieval period, like Bosch and um, Bruegel, super crazy, like the guy's got a bird for a head and he's like pulling stuff out of his ass and you know, Salamander Man is like eating the head of somebody. One of the great artists that's inspired us is Rodin. He was the first guy to do hell in 3D. He created the Gates of Hell, which is like a stunning sculpture and it's just got all these crazy bodies in it. His stuff captures that like human element that we really want to go for. Gluttony is very interesting. It's very organic and gross and 
you can see it's based on the ravenous desires of those who can never eat enough. We actually have an enemy that both vomits and defecates off of both ends. You know, I don't even know how she got the she label, but she's got the big belly, she's got mouths on her ears, mouths on her hands. It's another one of Wayne Barlow's great designs. She's got a great grab attack. She kind of picks you up and tries to eat you. She also has this projectile puke attack that really is uh, disgusting and, and a lot of fun. And then she also actually has a poop attack too. Cerberus is the traditional guardian of gluttony. In that kind of ancient mythology, it's a three-headed dog. We've kind of abandoned that version of Cerberus. When I saw that, I was like, whoa, that's not how I would have interpreted Cerberus. That was one of Wayne Barlow's creations where it's, it's almost as the three heads have actually puked out of a human and it's just, just disgusting and it's, it's weird, but you can't take your eyes off it. Blood is the third circle of hell, and it's gonna get really weird pretty early in the game, and you've still got, you know, six circles to go. Dante's a no hold barred, uh, unrelenting, never say die, just not gonna give in. If anything sort of confronts him, he's, he's ready to go up against it. Kind of a brutal bastard. Dante's not a good guy. He's like, oh, It's a guy who kicks down the doors of hell, quite literally. Kind of a basically. The thing about hell is it's hard to find someone who could stand up to all that. And that's really was the impetus to make our character as badass as he became. The poet, as he goes through hell, he's fainting and Virgil picks him up and carries him over spots. And that's not a character that we could use for a hero. Real Dante was in Florence during the Civil War. He was more of a politician. We wanted something a little bit more. And uh, so we made the bold choice to give him a, a pass as a crusader. <laughs> He's had a pretty tragic and, you know, screwed up past. A lot of things in his past that haunt him. You know, he's definitely not some, like, straight sort of action hero. You know, I like the fact that he's a little bit more human. I mean, obviously, he's wielding this giant scythe that most of us couldn't lift. Um, and I know because we built one for Comic-Con. So he's definitely, you know, superhuman in that sense. But there, there are certainly moments in the game where he's not sure if he can go on. I think the story kind of demanded that he be a little bit more complex. The first line of the poem is, you know, at the midpoint on the journey of life, I found myself in a dark forest, and it's a metaphor for him being confused and troubled about his own life, but we wanted to go to the nth degree for the video game. And so we, we wanted him to basically have committed all these horrible sins. Dante is guilty of all nine sins and then some. You definitely start to see how his family factors into it, and you might start to see some familiar faces as you're going through hell and how that sort of messes with him. He's done a lot of bad things in his life. I think one of the important things is as you play through the game, you realize that Dante also tries to redeem himself. The tapestry on Dante's chest is basically this enormous symbol of guilt for him, summing up all the terrible deeds that he's done, or all the terrible moments and memories of his life. The tapestry represents Dante's realization that he needs to suffer for his sins, the same way that people have suffered by his hands. Remembering things, he's remembering horrible things, so we wanted them to be like nightmares, you know, and we knew that we wanted like a really cool mechanism for showing those kind of flashbacks in the game. He's literally wearing the sins of his past sewn into his chest, and he's the one who's sewn them in there. We unfold his past transgressions through a series of flashbacks. Start to discover like how much of a bastard Dante really was. Greed specifically is a turning point where you've discovered a lot more about Dante than maybe you even want to know about. Greed's a little more of a of a cerebral level. It's about puzzles. It's this very mechanized place with gears and you know, motors, as opposed to most of hell, which is very organic. It's in a lot of ways the most hellish level. People are being tortured there in ways that you uh, haven't seen yet. It's almost a big stone factory of torture. One of the big set pieces of Greed is the Wheel of Fortune. Everything in Greed is kind of controlled by this twisted wheel of possibilities. The Order Waster are actually two characters in the poem. Uh, we've combined them into one. Technically are two people, but they've been sewn together. One wants to hoard and collect wealth, the other wants to constantly expend wealth. And they're stuck together for an eternity to sort it out amongst themselves. Greed is all about torture. And, and teasing people with the lure of gold and ripping them apart as they reach for this. Totally different sort of environment. You got molten gold sort of gripping on the sides. It's a complex level, but it's, it's pretty fun to go through. 
Reed's an interesting level because um, it's really kind of the beginning of Act 2 in a lot of ways. You're going to leave Greed behind, descend down into the fifth circle, and, uh, which is anger, and that's where the, the putrid swamp of the river Styx begins. In the Inferno, there's just no way to just hang out. You know, I'm just going to go to the jacuzzi area. Anger is all about just intense violence and rage. Everything in the world is against you. Cutting limbs off, heads are coming off. Boom, boom, boom! Anger is definitely a level that sounds like it's sort of a malicious fury. Second to second gameplay experiences is, is really where Dante's Inferno pays off. We have a combination of a multiple set of weapons. We've got Death Scythe, which is your big, powerful melee weapon. We've got the Holy Cross, that shoots holy magic, and it's a range attack, it's a stun attack. You can do a lot of things with that. In addition to that, we have magic. You'll have magic powers that are on the righteous side and the unholy side. If you're in trouble and you want to like get out of the way or jump in the air or roll over there, whip out the scythe, blast the cross, all those things just kind of lead into each other. To stop, start up something else. The main thing is you have a big ass scythe in your hand. We had like a sword at first. It just wasn't feeling right, it just felt like small and puny. The scythe's the thing here, that's the most the other character in there. The scythe that Dante uses is actually Death's scythe. It's dark, it's evil, it's punishing, it's sharp. There's actually a lot of different modes you could go in. It could kind of have this sort of straight spear like mode. It also has what we call sort of the collapse mode, where it's more like a scythe that's just on his wrist. At the beginning, we're all trying to find different things. We actually bought a scythe. You know, farmers, uh, you know, monthly or whatever. So we bought this scythe. As soon as we got the scythe, it's got the little handles like, no, this ain't gonna work. Sometimes you'll come into work and like you'll go to the kitchen and get coffee, and there's just like some guy over there like with a broomstick and looking at himself in the mirror, like doing this or going. So not only punishing everyone with that scythe, uh, the other part of the combat is you've got a cross as well. The cross primarily is about stunning, pushing back holding off enemies to buy yourself time. You know, it never really touches anyone physically. It's more about the power that they get from it. It's a little bit more about um, crowd control. I kind of liken it to sort of like the force in Star Wars. It's really used as a great way to either set up a combo or a way to hold them in place while you're going to beat the shit out of them with the side. We really leave it open to the player whether they want to go sort of all in on the holy powers, whether they want to go all in on the side powers, or do a mix of both. It's kind of a reason that Dante's got these two weapons, kind of yin and yang, and they're dualistic. And that plays out, and not just the combat, but in the story as well. It's the whole personality of Dante's Inferno. The most important thing to us was making sure that the combat felt awesome. One of the big things that we wanted to do in Dante's Inferno was really have the game run at 60 frames per second. 60 feels free, it feels fluid. 30 feels like you're drunk. I mean, we did some tests, you know, where we took 30 and we took 60. You could totally be As soon as you go to 60, you just see the flow, you see the trails, the sights leaving behind, and just the smoothness. Yeah. It's a visual and a tactile thing. It's how it feels, but 60 frames a second is pretty good. Especially with all the great effects we got going on in the game now. Sassy. By the time you get to anger, you're kicking some ass, but don't get too comfortable because pretty soon the shit's really gonna go down. Knowing the anger, which is really combat focused, and you're really gonna test your skills in that arena, then you're gonna go into heresy, which I think will make you think about certain things that you may not normally think about in a video game. Dante starts to go wild. <laughs> The transition from anger to heresy is probably one of the wildest rides we have in the game. The city of Dis is really the classical fire and brimstone hell. You're in hell proper. There's more fire. There's more darkness. The punishment there for the heretics is to suffer for all eternity in a stone box uh, on fire. This is the devil's backyard. You're now in the show. In the poem, the souls that go to hell are referred to as shades. Poor bastards who are going to be tortured for eternity because of really poor choices that they made in life. Abandon all hope. 
the Inferno in, in a lot of ways, if it has any one single point, is that you choose to sin or to not sin. I wanted moments in the game where players had to make a kind of moral choice. Do I want to be a total bastard, or do I want to be a nice guy? The more holy actions you take, the more powerful your cross is. The more people that you're slicing up with the soul reaping scythe, the more powerful and unholy you become. Just that second to second moment where you're going to either just slice their head off, or maybe you use the cross, exercise them, and save their soul. If you choose the unholy path, you become more like the devil every step of the way. The game has one story, and there's a great story there, but there's a lot of different ways to play. A lot like life, it's hard to be holy, but the gracious, reward is much greater. Gracious, gracious Lord. Look, when you're talking about hell, it's hard to avoid the topic of religion. I don't think we could have made this game without talking about religion in some form. We have a level themed around heresy, right? How can you talk about heresy without religion? Yes, it's dealing with kind of Christian themes in Christian mythology, but it's also dealing with a lot of ancient mythologies and a lot of folklore. When you read it, it's very, very fantastical. It's like reading a fantasy novel. Dante Alighieri, when he wrote the text, he was actually exiled from Florence at the time. He wrote this poem that took a lot of his contemporaries and placed them in hell. There's no question that he throws a few bishops and popes and priests under the bus. We definitely have had some people say this is something EA shouldn't be doing or you know, we're desecrating the original poem. I just don't agree. We've taken it pretty seriously. Without being literal and bound by you know, the exact text, because, come on, that would suck as a game. It is a video game, and we took liberties, there's no doubt. Controversy around the game will probably center around very mature imagery. I have had some concerns at night about receiving things in the mail that I didn't want to receive. I've been called a baby killer, so it can't get much worse than that. As you exit heresy, a world of pure fire is left behind. You see below you a river of boiling blood. You're now descending into violence. Violence is hot. It is like burning sand deserts. It's pretty tough going. By the time we get down here, it's pretty dark. It's getting very treacherous. Raining fire, just seething with negative energy. A place where nasty people have done bad things to themselves or other people. Violence is divided into three sections. Violence against others, violence against themselves, or violence against God. It starts off with people who were violent against others immersed in this river of boiling blood, and they're buried there up to their heads. They have to cross this nasty river first before heading into the wood of the suicides. They're tormented by being turned into trees and having their, their limbs broken off for all eternity. And finally, you get to the burning sands, this hideous wasteland where people who were violent against God reside. Francesco. Francesco is Dante's best friend from Topside. He took a bullet, so to speak, for Dante. You! You did this to me! Francesco was Beatrice's brother. Promise me, Promise me you will protect Francesco. He's someone who fought with Dante in the Crusades. And Dante promised to look after him, but didn't necessarily do his job. Now pay for what you have done! He's got swords coming out of his back. It's kind of the, the metaphysical representation of what Dante did to his friend. Well, he's actually going to stab you in the back with it in the game. The poem is riddled with really sweet enemies. From an art side, we can pretty much throw all kinds of stuff together. But the framework of the design and the gameplay comes first. You sort of find something that Dante talked about that was unique to that particular punishment. We took those, those aspects and made them part of our enemies. Whoever or whatever we design has this sense of anguish or torment about it. Often using the disturbing as one of the watchwords of the project, and that comes along with the sound as well. <laughs> Snarls, things that, are, that come from down here that you wouldn't want to hear when you're walking through the woods alone at night. The Archdemon is our big flying badass. He is like the captain of the demons. He's kind of the mega demon. He's big, he can fly, he's got that advantage over you, but Dante has some tricks up his sleeve. Every level will have something new for the player to see. And the fight. And if they're good, kill. Behold!
Welcome to the ten circles of fraud and deceit. Fraud is the moment in the poem where Dante really starts to get pretty twisted. This really is all about the lowest of the low in this dark, dank, horrific place. You're being haunted by the forces of hell here. These flying guys, guys on the ground. It gets pretty brutal. Wave after wave of enemy. You can't run away from the combat here in Fraud. You have to fight these guys right here, right now. Fraud is where the liars all go. I was trusted by you! Falsifiers, evil counselors, the panderers and the seducers, they're the sowers of discontent. Thieves, grafters, the politicians, ah, we kept everybody. In the text, he calls it the malabolge, which translated means evil pouches. The malabolge are these pockets. Each one has a different sin, and each one has a different punishment described in great detail by Dante. It's kind of like a dank, stinky cellar. Things are rotting. It's very dark and it's very creepy. You really can't see where you're going. It's getting smaller and smaller and deeper and deeper. There's not a lot of light seeping down from the top. The only thing you're going to see that shows up really well are things that are on fire. There's definitely a couple of those. Of course, you're fighting for your life the whole way down. And if you're not fully prepared for it, you're going to be in a little bit of trouble. <laughs> Fraud is composed of a series of arenas. Seriously, like a fight club. It'll be a real gauntlet. Gameplay-wise, it's a, it's a real sort of test for the player. There's almost combat puzzles. You've got to be thinking a little more strategically than you do in most arenas. Every creature that you faced, you're going to face again here. You're attacked by tons of them at a time. It's like a high school reunion. Except you get to cut everyone's heads off. You're really going to be playing your play style at that point. It's where you get to use whatever upgrades you've chosen to buy. If you focus on the scythe, you're going to have lots of scythe combos. Uh, the holy side of the upgrade tree, you'll be rewarded with martyrdom. It sucks guys in and lifts them up in the air so you can jump up and wail on them. There's one challenge in particular at the end of Fraud that it basically throws everything in the kitchen sink at you. The designers have a little fun and really torture the player. We have a moment to kind of catch a breath, and then there's going to be a moment when basically all hell breaks loose. You're going to be just in complete panic mode. Fraud is sort of this capstone moment where things are going to get really hard. In my mind, fraud is the hardest level in the game. As you exit the circle of fraud, it goes from cold, dark stone to ice. It's not over yet. You've got to go down into treachery and defeat the final boss, Lucifer, in the very bottom, frozen in his own tears. So the ninth circle is the big one. We're going to resolve Beatrice, we're going to resolve Dante, we're going to resolve Lucifer. It'll all play out in the ninth circle. The ninth circle is where the big boys get Lucifer. We're now in the very, very bottom depths of hell. It's a completely frozen wasteland. Treachery is cool because it's literally hell frozen over. Lucifer is actually frozen in his own tears. You hear the term a lot when hell freezes over, but we're actually going to show you a frozen over hell. It's lovely in a strange way. Of course, when you see the lake at the bottom, it's no longer lovely. The very bottom of it is Lake Cocytus. That's where Lucifer sits embedded in the ice. The three different faces of Lucifer are actually chewing on the three worst traitors in history. Hell is sort of formed around him. His punishment is the denial of God's presence, the denial of paradise. And even though he's physically trapped, he's able to project himself up onto the earth throughout the different circles of hell in a kind of shadowy, inky form. Beatrice, you gave me to Lucifer! In the poem, he's really locked down in that ninth circle. In the game, we really brought him as a villain to the forefront. Really give Lucifer sort of a bigger role. It was this idea that Lucifer would be presented almost like a human kind of guy. 
from the beginning of the game, he's in your face. He's dangling your girlfriend in front of you and saying, you can't have her. Come on, sucker. There's this kind of love triangle thing going on. He kind of taunts Dante and shows different parts of Dante's past and kind of antagonizes him all the way through. So by the time you see him, you're ready to kick some ass. I think the amazing thing about Lucifer is that he once was an angel. I mean, he's the, the prince of darkness, the, you know, the king of the underworld, all these different things, but at his heart, he knew heaven. The story of Lucifer, the shamed son, is something that's just constantly compelling. He is sort of the embodiment of everything that's evil, sort of the ultimate bad guy. What comes after hell? Well, we're truthful to the poem, so this one hints there, certainly. It doesn't take a wild imagination to think where we're gonna go with this next. It's an incredibly rich piece of literary work, and it's an amazingly imagined world. It would definitely have had some people say this is something EA shouldn't be doing, or you know, we're desecrating the original poem, but um, I just don't agree. What I'm finding is that people are saying that they're reading the poem because of the game project. Dante, your fate is decided. I think it's human nature to find more fascination with that which is darker. Anyone who lives and dies is curious about where they might go. It's an eternal story.